my name is John Taylorson and uh, today it's my pleasure to facilitate this webinar which um, is, is not just about um, resilience, it's also about tax, it's about VAT, um, but it's going to be a lot more interesting than that might give you the impression. So, um, Hugh Thomas from Puffin, some of you will remember from previous webinars. Phil, you might remember from one of the webinars, and Andrea has joined us today, um, and she's from Centurion VAT. So, I'm going to pass over to Hugh for a moment to uh, just introduce us all properly, and then I will um, I will take over again, and we'll um, spend the next 45 minutes to an hour chatting through um, tax and VAT and excise and management information systems and the like. Hugh, over to you, please. John. Um... It is a short introduction from me. You know, I've, uh, I've got a role on the, the Welsh Food and Food and Drink Industry Board. Um, and one of the work packages that we developed a number of years ago was the, the Investor Ready Programme and um, Building Business Resilience, which uh, Vic are now delivering on behalf of the Welsh Government and the, the Food and Drink Board. You know, and this is a series of seminars. I think, you know, hopefully most of the people who are listening in have already perhaps been on one or two of them. But... Uh, is a series of seminars to hopefully, you know, upskill the sector, you know, and have some open discussion on, you know, on improving their businesses and, you know, how, how, how businesses can have better control over their finances and uh, improve their discipline in that area. Brilliant. Thank you, Hugh. Okay, so um, this year you may have noticed we've had a bit of a crisis and uh, that's really tested companies both in terms of uh, some of the subjects we've covered in terms of uh, planning, risk mitigation, trade credit. But very often corporate structure and tax has come through, not least because that has stopped some people being able to access some of the assistance they might otherwise have been able to get. So today we're going to talk through some of those issues. As we do that, we're going to have, we've got a, a chat function so that you can uh, uh, ask questions or make points as we go along and we'll, uh, we'll try and answer those as we go. Um, for my part, um, being a uh, previously food and drink business, I too have struggled with VAT and tax and the like, not just understanding it, but also the administration behind it. Um, so, you know, for lots of you, um, small or large, it sometimes comes as, you know, a bit of a pain. And yet it is very valuable, particularly for food and drink businesses, because of course, ordinarily, we are net beneficiaries. We actually reclaim the VAT and we don't have to charge it on a lot of our outputs. But knowing when to charge for VAT, of course, is extremely important and what is recoverable. Um, I mean, tax needn't be taxing, but it is a worry. Um, and of course, HMRC are renowned for not having a sense of humour if you get it wrong. So today, one of some of, the, some of the areas we want to cover are how you avoid getting it wrong. We're not going to get into individual tax advice. That's not really for today. But hopefully you'll go away with an idea about what you should worry about, when you should worry about, and who you should go and worry about it with. Um, so... Without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Phil in the first instance, and let's just talk about it right at the start, corporate structure and tax. What should we be and when should we be paying for it? Phil. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I, I changed the name of that a little bit. I once tried to do a webinar on corporate structures and nobody uh, signed up for it. So I suppose in that sense, it's, this is a good start. We've got um, 17 participants, um, but um, I think nobody turned up because it doesn't sound terribly exciting. I, I, I pitched that as um, setting your business up to succeed. Um, and there is a bit of understanding at the outset around what that means. Um, I guess, broadly speaking, we encounter uh, three structures, and I will keep this um, brief. Um, lots of people will start out as a sole trader. So they get going, they start selling some stuff, um, and at the end of the year, they try and work out how much stuff they sold, how much it costs them, um, and ultimately feed a sort of profit number into a self-assessment tax return. Um, so that feeds into income tax. Um, many businesses have kind of grown up and particularly in the rural community as partnerships um, where broadly speaking you get together with some other people 
run a business, um, again, go through the same process of working out what you sold, what it cost you, um, and again, coming out with a figure that's split in line with perhaps a partnership agreement, if we've gone that formal, um, but more often than not, um, in line with, um, I guess, an idea that the partners have got. Um, and that number goes on a self-assessment tax return, so back to income tax. Um, and finally, um, and very commonly, of course, uh, the limited company structure, um, which is slightly different. Um, limited by its nature, so limited liability, um, which uh, deviates from the structures that we just talked about, the partnerships where there is liability of the partners or the sole trader. Um, and really that means that actually if the business were to become insolvent, I suppose in simple terms, um, then uh, it, you, the uh, shareholder, potentially lose your investment, but it's not a liability um, to you personally. And that's kind of broken with um, personal guarantees, so a bit of a word of caution before everybody says that there's a, there's a kind of capsule there. Personal guarantees to the bank um, are exactly that. They are personal, so whether you're limited or, or not. Um, Companies pay corporation tax um, and on the salary that they'll pay to directors and shareholders, um, the director and shareholder will pay income tax. Um, they will also pay income tax on any dividends received from the company. So broadly speaking, most businesses will contend straight off the bat with um, either just income tax on any profits that they're generating to them personally or in a company structure, some income tax and some company tax. Um, so we're already up to two taxes. Um, anybody that's got ambitions to, or is likely to, or is selling more than 85,000 pounds worth of stuff is also going to be contending with VAT. Um, and John put it kind of simply and said, well, look, in the food industry, aren't we all kind of um, uh, the beneficiaries? Of, um, of the kind of VAT game. And actually, it's just not that simple, um, which it won't surprise you to learn because um, you've got um, a whole load of people in the food chain um, that absolutely are the beneficiaries from the, um, from the VAT uh, um, regime. And they can reclaim the costs of their inputs, their capital expenditure, um, and that's great news. And they perhaps <coughs> don't charge VAT, or at least they charge it at 0%. Um, right at the end of the food chain, the restaurants that you go and visit um, act as tax collectors because they do charge VAT at 20% and they can, once they can reclaim it, um, they're usually net losers in that game. So it's too simple to say that the VAT um, uh, market will kind of lead food and drink businesses to be in one area or another. Um, and Andrea will no doubt touch more on that. Um, but why would I be um, any of these particular structures? Well, I touched on limited liability um, of a company structure. I suppose, candidly, the most ambitious businesses um, are, are seen as limited companies. Um, so for those that have got a growth ambition beyond um, a, the kind of small business around the, um, around the, the family house, the family home, um, you are likely to see a limited company uh, structure and you are likely to see a VAT registration um, and in time and as you grow um, people start to look at um, credit they start to look at the health of your company and they expect to see that you're in that limited company structure um, you might well say at what point do I become a limited company um, and actually uh, uh, that's a discussion that you need to work through with somebody that understands the um, whys and wherefores but from a kind of purely tax perspective um, if you're generating um, uh, or anticipating kind of pulling out something in the order of £100,000, um, then uh, I'd start to be thinking about whether you're a limited company structure. Um, one other quick word on, uh, on structures, um, and we will, I'm sure, touch on it in the, um, at some stage in the, uh, the course of this webinar. Um, many of you will have come across R&D tax credits. R&D tax credits are a great thing for the food and drink industry because, as the name suggests, if you're doing some sort of R&D, you may be able to claim a credit or pay less tax. Great news, they only apply to limited companies. So it's just worth having that in your mind. If you're at the startup phase 
and you think I'm not quite big enough to be a limited company, but I've got all of this research and development that I've got to go and do to get my new product launched. R and D will only apply to you as a limited company. That's um, great, Phil. Well, you haven't touched on excise, and I know some of the alcohol and cider makers and what have you um, have that that little worry. And also, uh, we've already had one question, which you've already touched on a little bit, is um, particularly for those people who are starting a, a food and drink business, maybe uh, in conjunction with their existing work. Um, are they better off, um, you know, with the uh, particularly if they're a high rate taxpayer, um, you know? dividends, corporation tax, uh, being often as well, of course, they put their own money in and they've got a director's loan account. Does that, that all gets a little bit confusing for people as to what's the most advantageous way from a tax point of view? Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll touch briefly on the um, exercise point. Um, it's it's a really interesting um, point and nobody is happy, I can tell you, in the, um, the game of what duty that they're going to pay. So um, uh, the small brewers want a different regime. The cider makers um, feel like they fall off a cliff because uh, duty kicks in when they go beyond 7,000 litres. Um, you know, the spirit makers um, uh, pay their duty up front. It, it, there is nobody that feels terribly happy about the, um, uh, the duty regime that they're in. Um, and everybody watches the budget very closely um, because it will um, affect the profitability or otherwise of your um, of your business overnight yeah. um, in many instances. I suppose what I'd say about that is you've got to be aware that if you're in that regime that that is something you've got to be considering um, and to be understanding the implications of um, how, when, um, you're going to uh, to settle up for that duty. And actually, you know, dare I say it, to understand what sort of business you think you can be running um, based on that. And a big um, example would be the cider maker that, for example, does, you know, might sell 7,000 litres of cider reasonably profitably. Um, I've seen businesses jump to selling 40,000 as they move into the, um, into the um, uh, duty regime and actually be no better off. Um, and so you've really got to understand the maths, the mechanics behind it, the finances behind it, and whether it's worth it. Uh, you know, more often than not, you'd say for a cider maker, maybe you've got to get to 80,000 litres of sales before actually you, you, you kind of make that leap. So that's a neat example. Um, uh, if I'm paying 40% tax, is it better to take income out as a dividend or taxable pay or a combination of both? Well, if you're paying 40% tax, then you're a higher rate taxpayer, which means, I suppose, broadly speaking, that your um, earnings are in excess of £50,000. Um, and actually, what will happen is um, you could take it out as a dividend, but if you want the same money, you're going to pay higher rate tax on uh, the dividend. Um, so... At a, at a basic rate, a dividend is taxed at 7.5%, at a higher rate is at 32.5%. Sounds like dividends are better. Well, it's not that simple. Um, it, those same thresholds for basic rate and higher rate are at 20% and 40% for, um, for a salary. Um, but you've got national insurance on top. Well, hang on a second, Phil, doesn't that all sound a lot worse? Yeah, perhaps. Um, but actually, the salary will attract a corporation tax deduction, which the dividend will not. Um, you might want a combination of both because an amount of salary relevant to qualify for your national insurance contributions would make sense, perhaps. Um, and, you know, I guess there is a, a marginal tax efficiency on taking most of the rest out as dividends. But again, there are wider considerations. Has the business generated enough profit to be able to allow you to take a dividend? Because in company law, they can only be paid from retained profits. So if you don't have any, they're not an option anyway. Uh, John mentioned a director's loan account. Many directors will have um, placed a large sum of money into their business um, that they are um, uh, owed back to them effectively. And because it was your money, your taxed income in the first place that you invested into the business, it is absolutely um, your right uh, to be able to pull that money back out and you don't pay any tax on it. Um, but actually, um, 
people don't often lend others money for free. Um, so you could take that a stage further and say, well, shouldn't I be getting some interest from the director's loan that I've put in? Um, and as kind of part of a bigger remuneration uh, package, uh, you might include a bit of interest that comes to you. You may or may not have clocked the um, interest, a certain amount of interest each year is actually tax free. So you could be making that loan account work even harder for you by charging your company interest. There's some form filling that goes with all of that um, and some administration, but understanding all of that in the round um, is going to be really important. Tax shield, effectively. Yeah. Okay, that's what the, the, the point is. If you're a food and drink company and you're in that position, it's worth having the conversation with your accountant about tax shields and what are we borrowing and the, the, the level of borrowing and how it affects our corporation tax. Can we get into our favourite subject of VAT? And I use the term VAT because normally it has a doing word in front of it whenever I speak to people in the food and drink industry. So, um, uh, <laughs> obviously, um, it is, uh, as I always like to say, somebody's explained VAT on food and drink to you and you've understood it, they haven't explained it properly. So without getting into digestive biscuits, Jaffa cakes and, and the, the like, um, the principle you, these days, I'm guessing, is, is that first of all, you need to ensure that you understand what you're producing and what its VAT status might be. Andrea, how do we go about doing that? Um, well, food, food um, that liability is, um, you know, it, it can be an absolute minefield. You mentioned the uh, cakes versus biscuit argument. There's, there's lots and lots of examples of things that you might think are zero rated, but are standard rated. Um, but um, there is, um, within, within the UK VAT law, there is a, a schedule for, for which lists what's zero rated. So um, sort of basic food foodstuffs um, and within that schedule as well as it telling you what is zero rated you know th there's a whole raft of exceptions that are standard rated as well so um, really important if you're starting out particularly to to make sure you understand where you sit within the the liabilities um, I think that actually, to be fair to customs, the, there is a good um, public notice on, on food as well, which has, um, you know, it's, it's quite a hefty notice and includes a lot of information on, on, on food as well, um, on related goods, connected goods. Just to, just to clarify that, I mean, they, what you're talking about is going on the HMRC website and having a look at the, the various fat notices. And I can recommend if, if we have a second lockdown and we, we're all playing parlor games on Zoom, if you want to play the, uh, the game of um, standard rated, reduced rated, zero rated, exempt or outside on food and drink, it's hours of fun uh, trying to guess yeah, which one. But that, that HMRC website, when you do go on there, that's not, that's... That's still not always entirely clear, Andrea. No, I mean, I, mean, I um, yeah, I, I wouldn't always recommend looking at customs notices. Um, for a start, they are customs interpretation of the rules, not, not you know, it's not always the case that they're, they're correct. But in the case of food, I think if, if you're starting out, then definitely should have a read of that particular one. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good starting point. But then I would also say, if you've got any doubts when you, you know, you've looked at the, the rules, you should always, um, you know, obviously I would say this, but you would always, you should always seek some advice to make sure that, you know, you, you're doing, you're doing the right things and that you've interpreted it correctly. So. That's where, that's where professional advice is a lot better than, I mean, I was, I was, I've always avoided and I've always said to everybody else, don't ring HMRC up and ask them a question you don't already know the answer to definitely and and also uh, on that these days um so i started off in customs and excise as a vat inspector in the in the 80s which is a bit scary um and in those days if you if you wrote in and, and asked a question i would write back and 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 give you try and give you the answer try to be helpful um customs make it very clear these days that um if if you shouldn't really bother them unless you're absolutely certain that what you're asking is not covered in their notices. And, and if you do ask them, their first pushback is usually that it is covered in their notices. 
so yeah customs are not particular not as i don't think quite as helpful as they used to be and they're probably more challenging than they used to be so you know if you've got any doubts i would say seek professional advice before you go to customs and that professional advice needs to come from people who understand food and drink as in rather than just generalist yeah uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we work as, as VAT consultants. Um, we don't do VAT returns. Um, so the sort of work that we get involved with is uh, complicated stuff that, you know, a, a, perhaps an account, a general accountant wouldn't be able to, to help you with. So in relation to food, go to a food specialist go to a VAT specialist. Don't, don't assume that, you know, you're, you're, you're day-to-day -day accountant um, knows the answers to everything because, um, you know, perhaps they don't, they, they you know, they're generalists in a, in a lot of cases. So go to somebody who knows food. Yeah. Talking yeah. of which, Phil, you know about food. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we, we could sit here and play parlor games, all the anecdotes about where VAT goes wrong on food and drink, but there is a serious point here in that it does go wrong for food and drink. I think you know, particularly those people who've got slightly more complicated or vertically integrated businesses and haven't understood and ploughed on regardless? Yeah, it can go wrong. Um, it can go wrong very badly and very quickly, actually. Um, I, um, it, it can also go right um, uh, if you understand what's going on and, and what you're doing. So a couple of, um, uh, a couple of tales, I suppose. Um, about two years ago, I took... Um, uh, took a lady on and um, she said oh, I'm a bit concerned because um, I've been working with an accountant and, and I'm not sure that we've got this or that set up correctly um, and we had a bit of a look uh, beneath the covers and um, the truth was she didn't um, and she ended up with a uh, £27,000 VAT liability that she didn't have any money to pay um, uh, and that was actually because she'd misunderstood um, her VAT uh, situation, her input and her output VAT, um, and had accumulated this liability um, uh, completely unknowingly from her perspective. And we had to, um, to help her to work out how she was going to deal with that, and then ultimately to kind of restart um, uh, and to go again. Um, and in doing so, to help her with getting the system set up to be able to record things the right way in the first place um, so that she knew what was coming, setting aside some money for the um, inevitable VAT bill at the end of the quarter and recognising that it wasn't all hers. Yes. Um, so that's how badly it can go wrong. Um, but, but I suppose there are some, uh, some um, better tales for those that have understood exactly what's going on um, up front and I had a really nice um, story at the moment with uh, a client that I work with that um, as many businesses did he's a restaurant um, and he, he clocked the um, he, through lockdown he was going to have to do something to adapt he had to shut the doors he was going to need to keep um, trading in some way and I suppose unlike many businesses, what he didn't do was just package up everything that he'd normally do in the restaurant and sell it on. He'd had a look, we'd had a chat, and he'd worked out, we'd worked out, um, that if he could um, sell cold takeaway food in a different way, um, then he could sell it at 0% VAT. Um, so instead of handing 20% of whatever he was taking over in the restaurant to the VAT man each um, for all of the sales each quarter, um, he could actually end up um, with money coming back in for the VAT that he paid on the packaging to put the goods there for the ab advertising or whatever it was, um, and actually um, not have to pay any VAT over for the sales that he'd made. And for the first time um, ever, uh, from his point of view, he's had a quarter now where he's, um, he's been in a repayment position. Now that won't keep going, um, uh, in perpetuity, but I suppose others sort of missed the trick with that, where they continued to sell the same food that they'd always sold, um, but got it delivered as a kind of takeaway. So, um, it, yeah, understanding exactly what it is that you've got going on is um, is of critical um, importance. And uh, when when you're in those sort of situations, that you're relying on, well, first of all, the professional advice to make sure you you understand the tax codes, but then obviously you need the systems. Uh, set up properly. Now, 
uh, I know we're all advocates here of, of, of the likes of zero, but of course you have to have that set up properly in the first place and tax codes change and those are our new VAT notices and what have you. What, that, two, two elements to that really. One, how do you make sure you're set up correctly? Two, how do you remain set up correctly? How do you make sure you're in, in an informed position to know that something's changed? Phil, perhaps? Yeah, so for me, I think this is where, um, and my view of this is that the role of an accountant has changed. Um, and we've moved from being a group of people that you dropped a brown paper bag off uh, to um, sometime after the end of your year um, that produced a kind of set of accounts um, that told you how you did nine months ago mm -hmm. uh, to, to needing to be um, relevant for today's businesses. And by that, I mean that actually the engagement is throughout the year and actually always in advance of year end um, and not after year end. And what does that mean? Well, it means that there's a more regular dialogue. It means that, um, uh, yes, we can get you set up um, at the outset on a, on a zero, um, but that actually, because we're in close contact, because we're working with you on a regular basis, um, we're able to spot and advise and discuss and challenge and look at the changes that are coming. And they're not just VAT changes, frankly, um, they might be changes that are coming out of an awesome statement. They might be changes that we see coming around the corner for pensions, for um, for capital gains, for whatever it is. But, but the, thing that the structure of the company might need to change to take advantage of new notices and the, and the like that come out. But for those, for the, Andrea, for those people who don't have fill um, and are smallish businesses and don't feel that they, you know, they, you know, they ought to be able to rely on their existing accountant. Where else should they be looking or what else should they be using as reference material to make sure they at least know there's something they don't know? Well, I, I think Phil's exactly right in, in, in uh, the way things are these days. You, you really shouldn't leave your accounts to, to the year end. You, you should, you know, it's, it's critical to know what's going on on an ongoing basis. And I would say uh, particularly, um, you know that's true if you're in in the catering restaurant takeaways sort of um business because um you know that's always been a, a really um you know it's a big favorite of customs to look at i mean I, i've worked both from a customs perspective and you know as a consultant on on unfortunately many many vat assessments where um, you know, HMRC have come along and said, you, you know, you've understated your uh, take-ins by a significant amount. And I think if, it, you know, if a business is doing its, uh, its accounts more, more regularly and, and not waiting to the year end, then, you know, it's in a position where it can see if, if, if things are going wrong, um, you know, if its margins are not right, etc., um, and, you know, a lot of these assessments that we see, uh, you know, they're not, they're not, I mean, half of them are, are, are not really correct at all. But, you know, it's, it's not always the assumption that, you know, the owner of the business has, has perhaps suppressed takings. It can be that, you know, you've got the wrong staff or, or money is going out of the business that you, you don't know about in some way. And, and keeping your accounts up to date is, I think, really important to sort of, to protect yourself against yeah. that sort of thing. I mean, there are a lot of a lot of people. Some of the people on this call and others I know. Um, I can imagine we've got people who are, say, for example, a, a coffee roasting business. It's got a manufacturing business at the back that's producing food and drink for selling online, for selling wholesale. But also at the front of the of the place, they've got a, a retail coffee outlet and an EPOS system. So that EPOS system has got to be set up right. It's also yeah. got to talk to. The, the, the rest of the business in terms of the information, the various revenue streams that are going out of the business. Who, yeah. who should, how should people be going about that and thinking about making sure that EPOS system is set up right? Well, set, setting it up at the beginning correctly is, is very important. Um, Phil mentioned that £27,000 assessment somebody had, and probably that was from a misunderstanding at the beginning about VAT liabilities. In terms of EPOS systems, um, customs are much better trained at interrogating those than they, they you know, they once were. Um, 
for a start, if you know, you, you, you must set up the codes correctly. If you've got a list of products that, you know, have different liabilities, you need to make absolutely certain that that's right because um, it's, it's a basic check if HMRC come in on a VAT inspection, um, you know, a good one would, would ask to see that information um, uh, and, and to review it. So really, really important, essential that you get that right. Um, and together with that, um, to make sure your staff realise um, why they, they have to do things in a certain way. Um, again, you know, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of problems where, where, you know, staff have perhaps somebody selling hot takeaway food and cold takeaway food and staff have no, you know, they perhaps not, they've just said to the staff, this is what you do, but, you know, perhaps they, they need to understand better that it actually is a cost to the business if you yeah. if you you know if you don't have the, wrong, right. the wrong button on the till you're actually yeah. Um, yeah. breaching the tax. Yeah. Phil, it's a disaster. Phil, for those people who've got EPOS systems and getting those to feed back into zero, just to just to sort of the finishing point on this is how how do you how do you help make sure those people are bringing that stuff in right and it's coded up in zero or whatever the right way because you've got these various categories and i must admit when i go into zero and raise an invoice i'm not entirely clear which code i'm i'm putting this stuff under between exempt and outside and zero and reduced yeah i, I think it's really interesting i think that um th there's a couple of things on system i think they're brilliant systems are brilliant for helping um to drive efficiency um, what they won't help you to do is understand what should be going on in the first place. Um, yeah. I think you've got to do a couple of things. You've got to understand what it is um, that should happen. Um, and if you can't understand it, then make sure that somebody can educate you or help you to understand and get it set up in the right way. Um, the system can then do its bit. And whether that's an EPOS system, whether you don't have an EPOS system because you don't have a kind of, retail um, uh, bit, you've just got um, a zero. Um, you've then got an output um, from that system and, and you can do some work in understanding that. And again, if you can't understand what the output is, um, then get somebody to help you. Don't sit there sort of scratching your head thinking, um, uh, 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 you know, I think this feels and looks like it's probably about right because it can be really costly. And um, I think you can also spend a, a whole load of time trying to get a system set up to support your business that actually becomes a kind of false economy. Um, and I had a, um, uh, a client before that was trying to get this um, ERP system set up, an enterprise resource planning system. It was all singing and all dancing and it looked at all elements of production and sales and human resources and, and whatever. The business just wasn't big enough to warrant that setup and that system. And so it wasn't quite right because he spent, he spent two years trying to get the system to do the right thing. And, and that was two years he could have been focused on the business with a simpler system and understanding what was going in and what was coming out. So I think it's um, uh, reasonably simple. M make sure you, you, you get it set up at the, um, at the start. Make sure you understand why it's set up that way, as Andrea uh, said, um, and make sure that you do something with it out the back, um, because if you don't, then you might as well not have it. I think that's the beauty of, of a system like Xero. Um, I, I'm not an accountant. I, obviously, I've got a finance background, but I'm not an accountant, but we as a business use zero as well. And I think it's very intuitive how it works. I don't, I don't think you need to be an accountant to, to use it well. It, I, I mean, I know the other brands are out there, but um, it, you know, if that is a really useful system, I mean, I, I understand it's designed by someone who's not an accountant as well, isn't it? So it's all helpful stuff. And, and for us, what I like about it is it's simple. It doesn't overcomplicate, you know, it gives us what we need. It doesn't, you know, do anything, um, doesn't require us to do more than we need. So, uh, yeah. I, I and you can track, you can, you can track with these systems who's done what as well, can't you? So if there is something to unravel, it, 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 it's at least you can see what it is rather than uh, people paying cash out of the till to suppliers and not keeping the paperwork straight. Um, just, just on that, particularly on the, 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 the people who are in um, hospitality and, and retail, we've had a question in from 
from Joe Smith for takeaway food about cold uh, uh, about buffets, and as that's cold, would that not incur VAT? And whilst we're not here to answer individual tax questions, is that principle in that? How do you go about thinking about a question like that when you're in business and you need to make a decision on the day? Yeah, you need to be um, just on on that type of thing. You need to um, and and. You know, as you say, we're not answering specific questions, but the issues that you need to think about there are, are you selling cold takeaway food or which is zero rated or are you in fact providing catering, which is not um, which is not zero rated. It's is it's standard rated. So, you know, if you're if you're providing cold buffets for events, um, you need to consider the rules. There are lots of you know, quirks around it, lots of conditions to be met. So, so if you are doing that sort of thing, you need to think, I need some yeah. advice here. I need to look at it before I start doing it. Yeah. And just, just on that, I mean, I've, I, in the past, I've had VAT invoices come in to me from large food and drink businesses, and they've just um, whacked that on, uh, Phil, when, when I didn't think that was, was liable. So I've pushed back and they said, well, it doesn't matter. You, you can reclaim it anyway. But it's not as simple as that, is it? <laughs> no, it's 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 not as simple as that. Um, uh, it, and it, you know, we've got to go about getting um, getting this right. It doesn't mean that people won't make errors. Um, but actually, I, I, you know, it's a really interesting point, John, because I think that speaks to the way that um, you kind of want to work with your supply chain, um, uh, and actually come into some. Um, uh, you know, a common understanding, um, but actually we've got we've got a kind of duty to get it right for one another because it matters uh, for one another. Um, it, you don't want your um, your business to be doing something that's not right because somebody else hadn't got their end quite right. Um, it, you want to be working in partnership with the people that you've got to work with, um, uh, and I think that's more important in this um, this uh, kind of moment um, with COVID uh, than it ever has been before and actually we're seeing sort of closer kind of um, allegiances um, alliances with with people looking at kind of strategic integration looking at, at, at joint ventures um, but but it, it, you know that to me is a kind of um, it's a compliance issue go and get it right and get the right get, get the right advice and, and work with your supply chain in the right way Huge. Yeah, H, sorry HMRC on, on that as well um, technically um, that is only reclaimable as input tax if it was properly charged. So you could have the situation where customs would deny you that that VAT reclaim rather than going back to yeah. you know, being nice and going back to the supplier and unraveling it. They would just deny yeah. you the, the reclaim. Well, well I, I mean, you say going back and then being nice. I mean, it was I don't think I was nice on the occasion because, of course, um, you don't want to be paying VAT on something you don't need to pay VAT on and doing the paperwork. Yeah, no, I meant HMRC, you know, in yeah. the old days, they would have said that, oh, we'll go back to the supplier and unravel it from that. Yeah. No, technically, they, they could say, no, you can't have that VAT. <laughs> yeah, which is always the worry, which is always the worry. Hence why, if you don't think it's right, push back. Definitely, definitely, yeah. Bigger organisations like Puffin Hugh, obviously, you've got, you've got those systems, you've got those ERP systems and the like, but at what point do you decide that you need to invest in those systems? How big do you, do you think you needed to be before you could justify that sort of investment to um, sort of systemize all of this admin? Well, what I would say on the ERP systems, John, is you know, there's a kind of, there's a whole track record of disasters in our sectors of people I know of, you know, trying to implement very complex ERP systems as Phil says that, you know, they've ended up paying software companies huge amounts of money and it's added no value to the business whatsoever. So we've got a very different system here, which is we run Sage as our kind of main accounting system. But then we've got a, what we call a manuf manufacturing execution system, an MES system that churns out kind of raw data that we suck out of SQL databases using Excel. And, you know, we then work on that for our management account and control. You know, so we've got a bit of a hybrid system that, works very well but you know I think the core of this is you know uh, when you get a larger business you've got to have a strong finance team you know we've got you know three very experienced people here you know they're all you know, they're all chartered accountant level you know and they're running our kind of weekly profit and predictives and 
you know, looking looking a year, a week, a, a month, a year ahead, and we update that every week. You know, so uh, it's using a kind of range of tools. I think you know we've got a bit of a, as I say, a bit of a hybrid system that works really well for us. You know, what, what that the benefit of that manufacturing execution system, and it also then runs traceability in the factory, and it it controls all the machines and. Makes, <laughs> You've integrated Link. several functions within the business. Yeah, links to the PLC control panels to start machines and control trace that, you know, does the, you know, which if you try to add the finance function on top of that, would have just made it, you know, a complete uh, dog's breakfast, really. So, it, you know, works very well with, with how we run it. Yeah. Well, you, 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 I can't speak highly enough of ERP systems when I've, I've, been, I've been involved in businesses where they've been implemented. So hours of, hours of fun. Phil, but the, the fundamental part of that is that the functionality within zero, as Andrew was saying, it does a lot of uh, good stuff very easily. And you've got, you know, almost an ecosystem of, of apps that can sit on top of that. So for many food and drink businesses, I know you get warnings or you get adv advice notes come up on zero anyway, don't you, for um, uh, things that you should be worrying about, particularly with um, uh, HR elements. Um, what what size do you need to be before you start investing in, say, migrating from zero to, to to Sage systems? How big a business do you think you know people are when they have to sort of grow into the bigger systems? Yeah, um, I don't think there's a one size fits all kind of um, answer to that. Um, and what I'd say is actually it, it, there's a probably um, more fundamental kind of guiding principle which is that you've got to have a, a finance system set up that helps you to understand what is going on with the business. And you could turn over, um, you know, a hundred million um, and still be using zero if it was, um, if it could handle the number of transactions, there is a sort of finite number of transactions that it likes to live with. Um, uh, but if it, assume it could handle those and you could still get the data out that you wanted to run the business, then I don't think that you, you look at needing to change. You might have other bolt-ons that, that deal with inventory or deal with um, whatever other bits of, and pieces you might, um, you might need. Um, so it, it, for me, that's, it, it's about what it's able to deliver. Um, and, it, you know, I sat in a um, meeting yesterday with, um, with a client that I've got. He's very profitable and has been for, for many years, which is great. And um, I've been saying to him, do you understand what's going on? You, you know, do you really kind of get what, um, you know, how the business is performing in this area and that area? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely do. I've got all my margins up here and I know what's going on in the, um, from a cash perspective. And I said, okay, that's, you know, that's great. Uh, and he wasn't interested really in, in sort of hearing it. Now in the last year, he's um, implemented a new system. And he said, and in the course of implementing this new system, um, we've actually identified that some of our margins weren't quite right. And um, instead of running at 21%, uh, which he's done for the last few years, which has actually, you know, kind of, obviously by, um, by luck perhaps, um, rather than judgment, resulted in quite good sort of um, result from his perspective. He's run the first part of this year at 25% with his new system in. Um, and what that's meant is that this year looks a lot similar to last year, despite the fact that he lost three months trading. That's a big difference. That's a very big difference. That's a very big difference. And so, you know, that is about the system being kind of fit for purpose, not about the size or scale of the, the business um, and delivering the information that you need to go and run that business. So what you're effectively saying is having, it's not just the tax codes right in the system, it's ledger codes. It's being able to identify the cost of sale for the particular either channel or product that you're producing. That's absolutely right. And it is... Um, unbelievable the number of businesses that we might come across uh, that will, you could identify a loss making uh, products that actually has been masked by the performance of the wider kind of suite of um, products. Yeah so some where some people say well that doesn't matter because we've got to sell that product anyway to have those customers you can't manage the profitability if you can't attribute the right cost of sale to either the product or the channel of distribution. Absolutely right. And don't get me wrong, there are strategic decisions you might take um, to, to go and sell a product that either generates a lower margin or perhaps just breaks even. 
and um, because as part of your lineup of products it's important i'm led to believe for example that wix sells cement at close to a loss um, but that you know that you can go and buy a cheap bag of cement in wix and actually while you're there you'll also go and pick up the pack of screws rather than heading off to screw fix because um, although you could buy it cheaper you happen to be in the shop um, and you know if you've got a strategic decision that's fine what you don't want is to um, to end up selling loss making products without a knowledge that um, that's where they are. I think in the world of on, uh, online where you have potentially uh, products that you might have to sell uh, either on van sales or delivered services things like potatoes you may not make much money on them but you have to have them on there um, so you leave you know because you won't you won't sell the other stuff so I think it's very very common within food and drink that we have products that we sell because we have to sell them rather than making money on them. It's knowing, it's knowing how much you're not making on them, I guess, is, is the key thing. Which brings us nicely to the future. And first of all, you mentioned it at the start and I did so we'd come back to it. R&D tax credits. Everybody's talking about them, but of course, there's one of those things that um, uh, we should be making more effort with, shouldn't we, Phil? Yeah, absolutely. So for those that don't know, an R&D tax credit um, is really useful. It's like it um, sounds. Um, it's related to research and development. Um, and it means that you either get some tax back, um, pay less tax, or, um, or in fact, that you can kind of surrender it for some cash coming into your business. Um, which would be uh, pretty welcome for a lot of people. Um, and that applies to... Be making, the key point there, Phil, is you don't actually have to be making money to benefit from R&D tax credits. No, absolutely. So um, if you are loss-making, um, then you can uh, elect to surrender the loss that the tax credit um, has generated for cash uh, coming into your business. Broadly speaking, they work by saying, what are the expenses that we've incurred on research and development? What are the, the costs of the people, of the product development, of the wasted products, the attempts that we made? Um, and it, it's in areas where you couldn't go out and find a commercial solution off the shelf, okay? And that doesn't mean that somebody else hasn't done it. Somebody else might well have done it, but they're not gonna tell you what the answer is because um, but it's commercially sensitive information. So you go out there and you go and develop it. Um, you work out what it costs you to do it and you effectively sort of multiply the cost of that up, um, which makes it look like it costs more and therefore you pay less tax. But that's a really important point as well about R&D tax because a lot of people I think have the misconception that if somebody else has already done it, it's not R&D. It's, it's peculiar to your business and whether you have done it or not before, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly right. Because somebody is not going to tell you, they're not going to give you the recipe for Coca-Cola. So if you want to go and make it, um, you're going to have to try and try a few things and you'll get some of it wrong and it will be rubbish and you'll throw it in the bin and there will be a cost of the materials and there will be a cost of the time for the people that are working on that recipe and the development. I suppose, you know, what could it be? Well, it could be that you want a cheese with a certain texture profile. Um, you want the, the calcium lactate crystals that are in there that give it the crunch. Um, you want a product that um, has got reduced sugar and is going to need to travel in a certain type of packaging because actually you don't want it, you don't want to sell it in plastic, but you don't want it interacting with the um, alternative packaging. Um, and you can't quite get it right. You want to, um, uh, you need, it, I suppose it, it even goes as far as software and, and Hugh was talking there about the systems um, that he had, that he's got um, uh, and the fact that it's not a whole ERP system. He's got bits that will sort of bolt together. Well, if there is kind of bespoke and it's a more contentious area with HMRC um, and it needs proper review and proper advice, um, but, it, but even if it comes to working out how to integrate systems to, um, to do something that people hadn't thought you could do or, or kind of, works for you there is potentially R&D uh, that's going on in that space. And the conversation you and I have had in the past is that because of course I'm duty bound to say that Bic has got a app that works on both uh, iOS and Android where you can record against individual projects um, the time you spend within the business on these so that um, your accountant can have a clearly printed out CSV file as often as they'd like to record all this. The advantage being Phil 
Well, we know that when you record R&D as you go, your claim is typically larger than if you give somebody a brain dump at the end of the year and guess at what you think you might have done for the R&D. Yeah. So it's constantly at the forefront of your mind and you're recording it as you're going along, you're going to end up with a bigger, better claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the record, accountants don't guess. If you don't record it, you're potentially missing out on it. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're, we're nearly at the end. Thank you very much indeed. Can I both, uh, as um, uh, Andrea, we, uh, we were going to have a prediction and a top tip from you, if we may, please. Um, right. Um, I, top tip, I would say get on board with Brexit. If you're an importer, an exporter, um, there are going to be changes. Um, and um, I would definitely recommend that you, you, you start... Um, addressing them and receiving updates from, um, I mean, we do them, but updates from anywhere and everywhere to make sure you know what's going on there and how that's going to affect you. So that would be my top tip. Are you issuing updates, Andrea? Can people access that from um, you? Yeah, we, we um, if, if you, um, we send them out to our clients regularly. My, I've um, got a lot of experience in international uh, trade. Um, we're running training sessions. But yeah, if, if anyone would like to go on our, our website, which is centurionbat.com, there's, um, there's a facility to sign up for, for newsletters, news bites. There's no um, obligation whatsoever. We, we won't pester you. But it's one way to, to keep on top of what's going on um, because, you know, there will be changes that affect you, even if your business is um, just involved with zero rated stuff, if you import and export. And in terms of uh, predictions, um, when we leave the EU, we could, um, it, it would then allow the government to mess about with, with VAT rates. So that could be in a positive or, or a, a negative way. Um, you know, they might decide that they want to help the restaurant industry more by um, keeping a reduced rate in place, for example. Um, and the other thing, um, which is not, it is a prediction, but um, it's, it's probably also going to be a fact, is related to making VAT digital. Um, anyone who's VAT registered will know that, you know, that regime has started submitting your VAT returns digitally. Um, there will be a day where you're also re expected by or required by HMRC to upload your data as well. So um, that's my um, not particularly pleasant prediction. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Phil, top tip and prediction. Uh, well, my prediction is that, um, uh, a bit like Andrea, that we're going to see an increasingly kind of digital world. Um, uh, and that's going to mean that um, actually corporation tax starts to get paid quarterly, maybe monthly. Um, uh, and that uh, I see get access to all of that data. I mean, it's also going to, uh, rather sadly, uh, do accountants out of um, uh, a revenue stream that they've enjoyed for the past 250 years, um, which is um, the idea that we go and pull somebody's accounts together at the year end. So um, that's my prediction. S systems will do that. Um, uh, and therefore, actually, uh, it doesn't mean that I think I'm going to be kind of wholly redundant. Um, I think that actually what it will mean is the relationship with accountants changes so that you need to talk to an accountant throughout the year about what's going on and the planning that's going on. And you either need a finance team like Hughes talked about that's got the in-house capability to go and do it, or you need um, an accountant that is going to be on the phone to you and talking to you, um, you know, once a month, say, about what's going on. Um, so my kind of top tip is that actually, if you feel like you've got that relationship with your um, with your accountant, great. If not, make sure that you can find somebody that you can, can get that with, because you, you should be talking to somebody once a month in the um, climate. You, after on reflection, top yeah. tip and a, and a prediction. I think, you know, top tip is to get, get people around you that you trust and will provide you with the right advice, John, isn't it? You know, it's... Um, it's interesting to talk about R&D tax credits because a number of years ago, now four or five years ago, we had a, one of these kind of off-the-shelf companies came in to give us some advice on this. And we felt as a board, it was far too edgy, if you know what I mean. I think, but we took some lessons from that and went back to people that we trust more and, you know, found a kind of equilibrium and, you know, a long-term position on what we do in that area. But, you know, we've got, 
we've got tax advice specialists and you know we've got our in-house team here and i trust all of those implicitly you know i'm md of a business i know very little about the detail to be honest john but uh you know we know we've got a team around us that know what they're doing you know so seek the right advice is my my top tip any prediction it's gonna be time to change i think you know an opportunity uh opportunities and threats you know but uh don't miss out on the opportunities yeah Okay, thank you, Hugh. Well, I think, I think just to summarise them, um, getting your business structure right from the word go and planning for growth seems to be older of the day. Tax codes plainly, both in EPOS systems and, and, and in um, your accounting system, and that comes back to ledger codes as well to make sure that you know what the cost of sale really is for a product or a market that you're serving. Professional advice, don't be ringing up HMRC with, um, with questions that you could get a, a, an answer from from R&D, plainly, that's a rich vein. And um, if anybody's interested in that, we can help them with um, a, a little app that'll help them do that. Um, I'm due to be able to say that we've got another of these webinars on the 29th of September at 9.30 in the morning. This one you'll love. It's Other People's Money, which is um, actually, I think, going to be pretty relevant because, of course, um, if you've run out of, um, of uh, means of raising debt, then you might be tempted to look at the equity sources, um, hence the title, Other People's Money. Um, I was particularly pleased with that one, as you can tell. Um, I have to thank Hugh, Andrea, Phil, and Linda for keeping me honest in the background. I have to thank everybody else who got up this time of the day, and uh, uh, hopefully you're still there on the other side. And we'll look forward to seeing you all and more on the 29th. Thank you. Thank you.